question about uh, big kernel lock. What is status and what is your prediction? <laughs> when it will be removed? It's almost gone. The big kernel lock does not exist anymore in any really important area. There are certain file systems where it exists, for example. If you use RiserFS, um, we have patches to get rid of the BKL in RiserFS, but they haven't been merged yet. That's, I think, the only major file system that people actually use that still use the, B, the, the kernel lock. There are some odd pieces that still have it. I think the biggest one may be... TTY. No, the TTY layer is getting away from it. Uh, it it's, it's be, it still uses it, but the, the, a lot of locking has been written so that someday we'll get rid of it. So the, the basics are getting there. I think there's like file locking may still use the big kernel lock. That is the tree. You have the tree, right, for getting rid of it? Yeah, I kind of dropped that tree in favor of Ingo's tree because okay. I was not working on it. But I mean, I did work on that some. We, we pushed the big kernel lock out of most of the core. So there's a lot of lock kernel calls and individual drivers and so on, and those can be fixed as, as time allows and people get motivated to do it. But I think much of the problem is solved. So basically, we think we'll have it done by next year, but we're not committing to anything. It's good corporate <laughs> speak. OK? As the rate of contribution to the Linux kernel increases and the importance to society increases, uh, is it becoming a more intractable problem to keep out malicious code or people with bad intentions? OK, so you're the one who's done the most studies on the kernel code. I'd actually broaden this problem so it's not just keeping out people with mal bad code or malicious code. A lot of code can accidentally be bad. We can introduce regressions into the kernel without even knowing it, and they don't show up until ages later. So Greg, give us your take on that. Well, we, we track regressions, so I, that's, but malicious code, I mean, it's hard to, I mean, bugs are bugs. I mean, it's hard to say was that malicious or not. Most everything, I don't think we've seen anything malicious in a long, long time that I know of. I, 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 I really, yeah. I, don't I don't worry about malicious people or malicious code, because realistically, there's the old saying, don't uh, what, what, how does it go? <laughs> I'm sorry, do you need a moment to collect your thoughts? I, I need a moment to remember the saying. But uh, the, the, our problems with bugs and security bugs, which is what people worry about with malicious code and malicious people, have never been people intentionally doing something bad. It's always being people intentionally doing something that is good and then unintentionally introducing a bug. That's that's a hundred percent of all the bugs I can recall have been of that kind. The only worry I've ever had about malicious people has actually been uh, one of the design factors in Git was to keep it so decentralized and keep everything cryptographically signed so that nobody could corrupt one of the public repositories. And then if somebody is able to inject bad code in one of the public repositories, it's something that I should immediately notice when it no longer matches what is in my repository. So we, I have been worried about that. And the only reason I was is because about seven or eight years ago, uh, we actually had a break-in on one of the BitKeeper uh, machines, and somebody tried to introduce a backdoor there and was caught with checksums by BitKeeper because they weren't very good at it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so it, there's been one case of that actually happening and failing that I'm aware of. And it failed. Maybe there's a hundred cases that didn't fail. Right? <laughs> the, the really successful ones we wouldn't know about. Uh, but I really don't worry about it personally. It's okay. But the flip side of this question is that we are merging code at a faster and faster rate, and we're merging more and more of it. And that code we merge has to stabilize before 
we should release it. Now, Intel, which Dirk works for, has been doing a well-known project to run uh, a database benchmark that we can't name over the kernel for every release. And if you look at the figures from those database benchmarks over the last 10 kernel releases, our performance has basically dropped a couple of percentage points at every time we've done this. And the cumulative drop is now up to about 12%. Is this a problem? We're getting bloated on huge. Yes, it's a problem. So what are we doing to solve it? Uh, I'd love to say we have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Please say it. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's a bit sad, but we are definitely not the streamlined, small, hyper-efficient kernel that I envisioned 15 years ago. <laughs> the kernel is huge and bloated, and our iCache footprint is scary. I mean, there's no question about that. And whenever we add a new feature, it only gets worse. So are we adding features too fast? before they stabilize? No, I don't, think, I don't think we've had stabilization issues. I think we've been pretty stable. Uh, we are finding the bugs as fast as we're adding them, even so, though we're adding more, of, more code. So, so what I think I hear you saying is that a 12% regression is acceptable in these terms. No, I, I'm not saying that. Right. Acceptable and avoidable are two different things. It's unacceptable, but it's probably also unavoidable. OK, so the summary of this is that you expect that 12% to be back to where it should be next year, and you expect someone else to come up with a plan to do it. <laughs> That's open source, right?